The Kerry King ESPs from the 90s, they had some sick finishes on them. Today we're throwing a Kerry King finish on a Jackson Rhodes. It's a Rhodes fit for a king. Be sure to hit the like button, definitely hit that subscribe button, and hit that bell to be notified when new episodes drop. This is Trash to Thrash. For more than 20 years, I've been obsessed with guitars. From playing them, to working on them, to buying and collecting them, I've built quite the collection of awesome custom guitars. Now, I'm turning my passion into a profession by seeking out old, beat-up guitars and giving them new life, all while trying to make a profit. I'll be searching everywhere for used gear that I can refret, rewire, repaint, whatever it takes to make it a real shredder. This is Trash to Thrash. Hello everybody, welcome back to Trash to Thrash. I'm your host, Mark Murray, and today we'll be rebuilding a customer's guitar. Henry sent me an email with some photos of the Jackson Rhodes that he wanted me to refinish and upgrade. We brainstormed together and we came up with a really cool design that I've never seen on a Rhodes before. My customer Henry bought this guitar over seven years ago at his local Sam Ash for about 200 bucks. He said I was out of high school and going to college so I didn't have much money. It was in rough shape but I figured it'd be a nice project to restore the guitar and slowly repair it in time. However, I quickly found out I was in way over my head. The guitar remained mostly unplayed for the next couple of years and last year I got the motivation to try and fix it myself again. I bought a new neck for it. You can't have a Jackson Rhodes without shark fin inlays. I was looking at videos of people who fix guitars on YouTube when I came across your channel, and well, here we are now. Over the years, there's a few key guitars that have just really stuck out to me and really inspired me. Obviously, the Frankenstrats are probably number one, but some of Kirk Hammett's guitars are just so awesome. I love the Mummy and the Ouija guitar. They're just too cool. But another huge one for me was the Kerry King ESPs. He had a couple ESPs that were just unreal. When I first saw these guitars, I was already making Frankenstrats and doing burst on guitars, but I was looking for some fresh inspiration, and man did I find it. I did the first Tiger Rhodes using a burst and then masking the guitar with hand cut tape as my stencils to make the pattern. I had a different style to my stripes, so I've always wanted to recreate the Kerry King pattern. So there are a few different versions of Kerry King's ESPs. Here in the 1995 ESP catalog, you can see the KK Standard and the KK Custom. The KK Standard featured a mahogany body and neck with a Kaler Pro Tremolo, Rosewood fretboard, diamond inlays, 24 extra jumbo frets, an EMG PA2, and a set of EMG81 pickups. Now here's where it gets a little interesting. The KK Custom is a neck through body version with red and black crackle finish and eagle inlays. The interesting part of this to me is that they called this a red and black crackle finish. To me, this looks like gold with black crackle on it, then they laid down a stencil or some masking tape and sprayed it red. This is from the 1995 ESP catalog and here you can see the same two models were available. But this here is the model that inspired me the most. I saw this paint job and thought it was so awesome. This is the one that we're going to be doing today on a Jackson Rhodes. I've never really seen anybody duplicate this paint job and that's exactly what we're going to be doing. We're basically going to be duplicating it but we're going to be making it fit onto a Jackson Rhodes body. We'll go over the full plan for this guitar as we go through the episode. For now, I handed this guitar off to my assistant Ryan who took it apart, sanded it, and got it prepared for the paint booth. This guitar had some chipped up corners, so after we do any repairs like that, I always like to give the guitar a nice base coat of matte black. It works as a primer against any bare wood that we may have exposed, and also gives us a really nice reference to see if the guitar is perfectly flat and ready for its real colors. Plus, since I'm using Rust-Oleum 2X matte black, it dries really quick, so I can start working on it again the next day and prepping it for its final colors. Fast forward a few days, and the guitar has now been sanded with 600 grit sandpaper. It's ready for its final colors. The Kerry King guitar we're duplicating is red on black, but instead of black and just regular red, we're gonna do a bright red to crimson red burst. And this looks good. It's a subtle burst, but it's gonna make the center of the guitar pop just a little bit. The little things are everything. Here's how I plan to duplicate these stripes. Using the old hand-drawn, hand-cut-out tape method definitely isn't gonna be the easiest way. So what I did was slowly and precisely trace the stripes on this image. Anywhere there's hardware, I filled in the gap of what I thought would be there. Then I removed the original image of the guitar, leaving only the stripe pattern. Then I converted it to black, I did a little bit of modification to make sure it would fit on a Rhodes. Due to the shape of a Rhodes and being that it's not a symmetrical V like the Kerry King ESP Vs were, we're not going to use the entire stripe pattern, but you can see here how well it is going to fit the guitar. 
I used Photoshop as seen here to trace the stripes and get the artwork prepared. This took some careful planning, so I brought the guitar into my office, took some measurements, made some notes, and as always, we ran into some technical issues. This is the Cricut machine, and the stencil material will be cutting up inside it. What made this tricky is I've never used this to make a full guitar overlay. And the Cricut can only cut things 12 inches wide, so I'm going to have to cut this up in sections, as shown here. This will be one section, and I'm loading that into Cricut's design space so I can cut that piece first. Now here we go. We're getting the mat and the material loaded into the machine. And now for the next minute or two, the Cricut's going to do its thing. It's really hard to see on here, especially through the camera, but the pattern looks great. Here I'm doing what they call in the craft world, weeding the material or removing all the negative space. That'll leave us just with the stencil that we want to use. This will be for the longer horn of the roads. It looks like it's going to fit great. Now we'll grab the next section of the pattern, which will be this here. And isolated, that looks like this. That should take about this much space of material. The last cut didn't weed as easy as I'd want it to, so I'm going to increase the pressure here. And now we'll cut up the next piece. Now that I've got all the pieces cut up in three different sections, we're going to lay them on the guitar to get an idea of if this is enough material or do I need to cut a couple more strips. And this isn't exactly how it's going to lay on, but it gives me an idea because I'm going to put it on stripe by stripe. I'm not necessarily going to transfer it over with transfer tape like this. But as I just lay the pieces on, I can see that this is plenty of striping. All the pieces extend from left to right across the entire guitar, so we're good to go. I had quite a few guitars to paint that day, so I set the stencils aside and came back to it the next day. Now we're back out in the shop and it's time to apply these to the guitar's body. Whenever you mask stripes or use decals or tape on a guitar, always make sure you wash your hands because the oils on your hands can get on the labels and they won't stick to the guitar right. The paint will bleed under the tape and you're not going to get as good of lines. It's also best to use an X-Acto knife to move the labels over to the guitar so you don't get any of the oils from your fingers on that way either. Another thing I did for this one was on the sides of the guitar, I wanted the stripes to come over a little further. The ones on the Carry King didn't, so I didn't have anything to copy for those, and I just used some masking tape to extend the stripes over a little further. Now imagine when I'm spraying this, anywhere where the decals are, it's going to stay red. So the whole back of the guitar is actually going to be going black when we repaint it. Now I could mask the back of the guitar off and keep it red, but I think the black is going to look awesome. All right, we're back in the spray booth, and it's time to throw the black on the guitar. I'm ready to see this thing with the black and red on it. When I do something where masking or striping is required, and I'm doing a burst as one of the stages, I always like to do the burst first, because it typically takes a little more paint to get a really good burst with spray cans. You may need to go back and forth and put three to four coats on, and if you're spraying all that in your second stage over tape, it worries me that it, the tape isn't going to come off cleanly. If the paint's too thick over it and you start pulling the tape, it could chip the paint away because the paint really encrusted over the edge of the tape. But there's pros and cons either way, because if you do the burst first like I did here, and your second stage, which in this case is the black, bleeds under the tape, I don't have a lot of options for touch-up. If you spray your solid color first and your burst in the second stage, your burst colors could bleed under the tape, but you can come back and touch those up with your first stage solid color. So there's pros and cons to both, but for me, I would never want to take the chance of building up too much paint over the tape and having the tape rip off and chip off some of the paint. And of course, we'll be doing a matched headstock on this guitar. I actually copied some of the lines from the body and changed the size so they'd fit the headstock appropriately, but keep the same look. And of course, then I threw some gloss black over that. After spraying something like this, I'll usually let it sit for between 12 and 24 hours before I pull the tape. If you let it sit too long, again, it could chip off. So you want to get it off fairly quickly, but you definitely need to let the paint cure so that you don't get finger impressions or any type of imperfections in the paint job from messing with the guitar when it's not ready. It kind of depends what paint you're using, 
how thick you laid it on, and other variables like temperature and humidity. After pulling the tape, I let the guitar sit for a week drying before I threw the clear on. For this guitar, I used Spraymax High Gloss Clear Glamour. They really should be sponsoring the show by now. I use them on almost every single guitar, and I love this stuff. The day I sprayed the clear on this guitar, I was spraying the clear on another guitar on the other side of the spray booth. So here you can see I'm using my neck through jig to paint a bolt-on. I had Ryan make me an adapter so I could use both of my jigs at the same time and paint two clear coats instead of one. Because some days I'll spray six guitars in one day, and then I can get it done in three hours instead of six. And after a full can of paint, about six coats, this thing is looking awesome. Had to take a couple of pictures of it for the gram. Just like with the vinyl stencils for the body, I made the headstock logo using my Cricut machine. But this time I used plain white vinyl, because this isn't going to be a stencil. I'm actually going to be leaving this on the guitar. With some very careful placement, we got a fresh Jackson logo on there. And we'll lock that logo in with some clear coat. Now it's been seven days since I sprayed the clear, and now it's cured. You can see it has a very reflective surface, but it's very wavy. But as I've talked about so many times in the past, when you do a paint job with different colors at different depths, like this one with the black sitting on top of the red paint, three coats higher, you can't expect one stage of clear coat to get everything perfectly smooth. So now what I'm doing is leveling the whole guitar using 600 grit sandpaper, so it's relatively smooth. But to get a mirror-like finish, I'm going to have to sand the guitar a few times using different grits of sandpaper, moving progressively from 600 up to 2000 grit. I use five different grits, 600, 800, 1200, 1500, and I finished with 2000. If I sand the guitar using all those grits, I'm definitely going to be burning through this clear coat and into my color. So to prevent all that from ever happening, I'm going to give it a quick level sanding here with 600 grit, and bring it back out to the spray booth and throw a bunch more clear on it. And after the second stage of clear coat, you could see how smooth it looks. It looks actually pretty good, but it's not quite showroom quality. Although I do think there's enough clear coat on there now that I could sand using all five grits of sandpaper and get that beautiful finish after I polish it. When I hit it with some 600 grit sandpaper, you can kind of see how uneven it really is. It looked pretty smooth, but this is going to get it mirror-like. Already you can start to see it flattening out. I hope you guys are enjoying the episode so far. Let me know what you think of this guitar down in the comments. And if you have any other questions while you're watching this episode, leave those down in the comments as well. Each week I look through them and I grab my favorite questions to answer over on my Sunday show, Sunday Morning Shred, over on the Guitar Guts 2 channel. Now there's a second Guitar Guts channel for more behind the scenes stuff, vlogs, Q&As, guitar hunting videos, and other cool community driven content. I'm currently collecting videos to play on there to show off your custom guitars, so if you want to be featured on Sunday Morning Shred with your guitar, send me an email. All my contact info is listed down in the description. And I also want to give a huge shout out to Iron Age Accessories for making these limited edition Trash to Thrash Season 4 guitar picks. They're so cool. If you're a pick collector and you want to help support the show, you can go grab one of those in the link in the description. There's a very limited quantity, so act quick if you want one. Over on the second channel, we recently did a shop tour of the entire Guitar Guts shop. Last week, I did a reading of the 1994-95 Jackson catalog, and this week I got a vlog going up that shows me opening up some of the parts used on the Trash to Thrash Season 4 guitars. Plus, I show you some of my pick collection. So go subscribe to the second Guitar Guts channel, which is listed down below. You could also go sign up to the Patreon page, which I'll be revealing the next giveaway guitar two weeks from today here on Trash to Thrash. I'll give you a hint, it's a Korean made LTD and it is awesome. It's only available to those in the CEO tier of my Patreon, so if you want to be entered into the giveaway, go sign up to that CEO tier of my Patreon. The links to that are listed down below. And after a couple hours of sanding, the entire guitar is sanded to 2000 grit and you can see how smooth it looks now. But it's not shiny or reflective, and that's where the polish comes in. I have a few different methods on how I polish guitars, but on this guitar, I use the hand drill with some Meguiar's 105 Ultra Cut Compound. After the second pass, you can see it's starting to look a little more reflective, but it definitely still has a lot of scratches from the sanding. So I add some more compound to the guitar, give it some buffing, and then wipe it all off. 
After the third pass using that compound, you can see the scratches are definitely going away, but it's going to need a lot more buffing. This is the process you just have to keep going back and forth, buffing it, and getting those scratches out. If you have stubborn scratches that aren't coming out, you can try using some scratch remover, or you might have to go back and do a little more polish sanding. And this thing is glowing. Colors are nice and vibrant. That gloss is super shiny, and you can see we got that mirror shine going on. Now I'll turn my attention towards the neck for a little bit. The headstock still needs to be sanded and polished, but I'm gonna work on the fretboard first. This actually wasn't the neck that came on this guitar. The owner of this guitar, Henry, sent me this neck as a replacement because he wanted a nice binding and some shark fin inlays and the original neck, also a 24 fret Jackson neck, had dot inlays and no binding. The frets on this neck were in excellent condition, but I did want to oil the fretboard. Rosewood fretboards look so much nicer, hydrated. They get some real character going when they get darkened. After level sanding and polishing the headstock, oh man, that looks awesome. To me, if you're refinishing a guitar with a really cool custom finish, you gotta redo the headstock too. A matched headstock just brings the whole thing together. With some companies, you only get this option in the custom shop because it's a cheaper way to just knock out a ton of black or white headstocks and have them on a shelf ready to go on any guitar you happen to be working on. You see this a lot with the lower and mid-range LTDs, Jacksons, and Ibanez. In this build, we're using my favorite tuners, Goto Locking Tuners, made in Japan. These ones in Cosmo Black, which is such a cool color for hardware. For this guitar, we're going with the Seymour Duncan Sentient and Nazgul set. Henry wanted the Nazgul in the bridge position, and I actually had a set on hand already. I got these pickups from my buddy Max, who I rebuilt his Les Paul and swapped those pickups out for some EMGs. For this build, we're going to be covering the pickups, though, with some Cosmo Black pickup covers. We'll even be replacing the screws on the pickups, so these things are going to look brand new. The Nazgul and Sentient pickups were designed for 8-string progressive players who wanted super modern tones. An early adopter of these pickups was Tosin Abasi of Animals as Leaders, who had these pickups in his Ibanez signature guitar. Because of him, I actually bought them and I put them in my RGA and they sounded awesome. They're passive pickups with a high resonance peak, so they give off very clear and balanced high lows and mids. They handle gain super well and the cleans of the sentient neck pickup are sparkly and clear. Originally, these pickups were only made for 8-string guitarists, but 6-string guitar players demanded that they make them for 6-stringers too, and Seymour Duncan obliged. Here's the completed pickup assembly with the new rings, covers, and screws ready to drop into the guitar. I think these things look super awesome. Now I've dropped in the two Borns 500k potentiometers, one for the master volume and one for the master tone, with an orange drop capacitor on it. I also used a black three-way selector switch and all black wiring so the guitar doesn't even look like it's wired up, does it? All right, and everything is ready to be assembled. This guitar is basically done. Well, all the real hard work is done. Just gotta attach the neck, throw some strings on it, and crank it up. So let's just jump ahead. You guys ready to see this thing all assembled in all its glory? Ready to have your face shredded off by it? The Cueva Rhodes, built for Henry Cueva. Inspired by the Kerry King ESPs of the early 90s. Equipped with Cosmo Black hardware, Seymour Duncan Nazgul and Sentient pickups, Matching Goto locking tuners, tunematic, and knobs. What a thing of beauty. It's got class. It looks deadly. I love it. Let me know in the comments what you thought about this thing.
Thanks so much for watching the episode this week, everybody. Let me know in the comments what you think of this week's guitar, and also what do you think of Cosmo Black Hardware? It's quickly become one of my favorite hardware finishes. Of course, that in gold. Next week on the show, I'm going to have an insane pair of Wolfgangs for you guys. One of them is a Wolfgang I've only seen Eddie play one time. There's only one video of him playing it, and it's of him playing it in Japan. So it's a pretty obscure one. The other Wolfgang is one that we took an old classic EVH finish and threw it on a modern Wolfgang. So it's one I've never done before, one many of you have probably never even seen before, and certainly one I've never seen thrown on a Wolfgang. Leave your guesses down in the comments. Let me know what you think it is. Just don't be rude. That's a little hint for the hardcores. Be sure to go subscribe to the Guitar Guts 2 channel. Every Sunday on there, I do the Sunday Morning Shred. This week, I got a Q&A coming up with a ton of real fun questions that you guys submitted. I also threw up a vlog of me opening up some new parts that are going to be used in Season 4 of Trash to Thrash. And I show you guys some of my favorite guitar picks from my collection. Speaking of picks, go grab yourself a Guitar Guts Season 4 Limited Edition pick at my website. The link to that is in the description down below. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you guys next week. Rock on, my friends. Here's a little sample of the Sentient pickup I was talking about earlier in the episode, how great its cleans were, so here are some of them.